Good evening, everybody. The topic tonight is genocide in Gaza, carnage in Israel, prospects for peace. I don't think I have to talk too much about the news everybody's been seeing, and I'm very glad to see so many people have come for this discussion tonight. We have three really good speakers to look at this uh, really difficult uh, situation, challenging situation, and a human situation. So uh, I'd like to just say who they are. The first uh, speaker this evening will be Ms. Samar Sabawi. She's a prolific playwright, a Palestinian, and she's a poet. And I, I'm looking forward very much to seeing her take and uh, her message. She's been in Gaza quite recently herself. Our second speaker is Mr. Shamik Badra. He's also uh, born in Gaza and came to Australia as a refugee. He's got a lot of experience going back a long time with this struggle. And uh, the third speaker is Professor Emeritus Stuart Rees from the University of Sydney, who's a stalwart of politics in the pub and uh, who helped organise this program tonight. So I'll just hand. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here and for your willingness to ruin your beer this night with our stories that are pretty sad, I would say, but hopefully inspiring somewhat as well. I like to always begin with my own personal acknowledgement to country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land I live upon and the traditional custodians of the land I come from, the Garigal peoples of this nation and the Palestinian people under occupation, and I pay my respect to our elders past and present who safeguard our history, the Hakawatis and weavers of dreamtime stories forever embedded in our memory. And I stand in outrage for black children in incarceration and Palestinian children in arbitrary detention, and the children of Nakba and stolen generation. I acknowledge the women who carve life from the sacred earth and breathe into it indigenous pride, and the women who give birth in the rubble, at checkpoints, and under Gaza's deadly skies. I acknowledge the men who still stand dignified filled with courage and pride, heads held high, unbent by oppression. I acknowledge those who resist the horrors of settler colonies and those who march with us for freedom and equality beyond the rhetorical apology and the meaningless sorry and the dazzling facade of Western civility. I come from colonized land, and I live on colonized land, and I pay my respect to all freedom fighters, past and present. <laughs> Palestine will be free, and this land will always be Aboriginal. I am originally from Gaza City, and I am a writer. My voice is part of the growing community of writers from indigenous and marginalized backgrounds who recognize the inseparable links between Western art, literature, academia, and knowledge production and the ideologies of colonialism. I write to decolonize, to honor, and to validate our Palestinian traditional ways of knowing and remembering through poetry and through storytelling. And while I learned growing up that embracing my Palestinian identity is a duty and a minimum gesture of solidarity with loved ones who are still trapped in the grip of Israel's occupation, I also learned that at the heart of being Palestinian is an unwavering commitment to the struggle for justice, freedom, and equality in a land that can only find peace in a shared coexistence and a shared resistance to oppression. This is neither a nationalist nor an exclusivist discourse. And there is room for everyone in this movement for freedom, justice, and equality 
And that is precisely what we mean when we say, from the river to the sea, we will all be free, and Palestine will be free. As I give this talk today, Palestinians, including my own family in Gaza, who were forced out of their homes and into a crowded strip of earth in the south, are facing one of two horrendous choices, death or expulsion. Both choices mean no return to their previous lives. Their beloved city is almost entirely demolished. The school year is cancelled. Universities erased. Places of worship no longer exist and hospitals bombed and shut down. If you ever wonder how you can erase an entire city, how you can steal a country, how you can blind a whole world, Look no further than Gaza today. Some might wonder what drives this madness and destruction, and if you think it's October 7th, or the Hamas terror attacks, or chimes some slogan that Israel has a right to defend itself, then you haven't really been paying attention. You haven't been paying attention to the story, so let me recap this tragedy for you. Let's go back to a time before Palestine was wiped off the map back when Palestinians lived on that land that stretched from the river to the sea. Before 1948, when the Zionist movement wanted to establish a state for the Jewish people in Palestine, they knew that they had to deal with two challenges. The first, they had to establish a Jewish majority on a land that was already populated by a vibrant existing indigenous population. And then once that majority was established, well, they had to maintain it. They had to keep the numbers that way, forever. So they set out to increase the number of Jews, first by way of encouraging Jewish immigration under the protection of and watchful gaze of British imperialism. Palestine was under the British mandate during that period. But even with this increased immigration, there still wasn't enough of a Jewish population, even in 1947, when the UN suggested that Palestine be partitioned. And it was just a suggestion, by the way. It wasn't, a, it wasn't more than a recommendation. But even during that time, the only district in all of Palestine that had a Jewish majority was Tel Aviv. The rest of it had a predominantly non-Jewish population. <coughs> So, to establish that majority, uh, they started, of course, the terror attacks. Um, uh, Jewish gangs started to terrorizing Palestinians out of their homes, out of their villages. And the end result was that between 1947 and 1948, the Zionist founders of the State of Israel deliberately and systematically decreased the number of Palestinians. But the point I want to make is that the use of terror tactics to force the expulsion and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, it's really important to understand that this is not something that happened in the past. This is something that did not stop happening with time. And the only times, the only reason that sometimes we would pay attention and sometimes we wouldn't out here in the Western world depended on whether or not Israelis were being killed. For as long as Palestinians were dying a slow death every day, by the tens, even by the hundreds, it wouldn't make the news. The, the pogos in the West Bank, for example, prior to October 7, did not make the news. The burning of, of Palestinian homes, the uh, arrests of Palestinian children, We've all seen, um, and, and you know, rightly so, have been very, very shocked by the fact that Hamas had kidnapped Palestinian children. Horrible, horrible stuff. You don't kidnap children, right? But how many of you knew that they were being exchanged for, for twice and three times the number of children that Israel had kidnapped? Except we're not calling it kidnapped children. We're, call, we're not calling them hostages. We're calling nine-year-olds prisoners. That is really at the heart of the problem. And so what we're seeing in Gaza, the point I wanted to make is that it's an extension of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And what is really dangerous about what we're seeing is that every time Israel has launched a war on Gaza, it has gone a little bit further than the time before and got away with it. 
In 2014, when it started bombing high-rises in Gaza City, there were no condemnations. When the UN Secretary General at the time was crying on television about how you don't kill sleeping babies. I don't know if any of you remember that, that heart-wrenching uh, video, but there was no accountability. And so Israel comes back and does something even worse and worse and worse. And to think that now, we've been watching for all this time, day in, day out, a genocide taking place, a city being erased, and we still can't get the government, this government, in this country, to condemn these acts that are clearly, clearly war crimes. They wouldn't even sit with the human rights rapporteurs when she came here. They wouldn't even sit with her because they don't want to know, because they don't want to be accountable and they do not want to hold Israel accountable. So this poem is called The Song of the Besieged. And it's about trying to make Gaza unlivable. The UN said Gaza was unlivable, but life beyond livability in Gaza is inevitable, like the rainfall and the winter storms. Life inside the walls is ferocious, like dandelion it grows, it powers through like inexorable love, like an irresistible kiss, like the burning of new life beyond the statistics of death. Life beyond livability in Gaza is inevitable like the sunrise, predictable like the movement of the tides, invincible like flowers in the desert, unassailable like a smile on the lips of the beloved, unequivocal like a word that splits bullets in half, indomitable like a revolutionary march, unstoppable like the earth's rotation, formidable like a fist in the face of occupation, undeniable like destiny, like freedom from tyranny, <coughs> like justice for the refugees. So listen carefully. Two million captive hearts are beating off rhythm. There is no harmony beyond livability, only the inevitable. Beware the inevitable. Until this day, Israel has not provided any evidence for any of its claims about the hospitals, the Hamas underground tunnels, which by the way, turns out Israel built the tunnels, you've all seen uh, Christina Manafort's head explode uh, in that CNN interview when, uh, when she was told that. But after all of this, our government is still quite silent and unable to say that it's wrong and to condemn what happened in Gaza. And so this poem is called Your Silence. I am exiled into the margins of your main everything, estranged in big theater spaces, radio talk shows, TV faces, political discourse and panels that delineate my expansive otherness. I am exiled in relentless daily press, in ignorant headlines and stereotypes that reduce me to less, in privileged, depoliticized art, blind to my right to exist. I am exiled in your list of forbidden words, Palestine, inaccessible truths, justice, the right to resist, BDS, the right to protest, fake multi-faith love fests. I am exiled in diversity, theatrics, and multicultural themes that patronize my dreams of belonging here. I am exiled into a hyphen wedged between two worlds walled in, yearning for impossible return, aching for acceptance, imprisoned within a skin I did not choose, 
a faith I inherited, a prayer mat and a headdress and all the familiar foreignness and fear. I am exiled in your fear, imprisoned within a sphere of rights dispossessed, grief named collateral, a binary of moderate and fanatical, narrating endless wars on terror. I am exiled in footnotes of imperial conquests in colonized academic research and theories of the West versus the East, the clashing civilizations in your everyday hate speech. I am exiled outside your hole and into invisibility and silence. I am exiled in your silence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samar. I just like to quickly hand the microphone to Shamik Badra. He's a convener of the Coalition for Justice and Peace in Palestine. So we'll hear his voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your support of human rights in Palestine and in the world. Regarding the main question of this meeting about prospects for peace, yes, many politicians and historians have focused on the reasons of the failure of the so-called peace process between the Israeli colonial state and the Arab states, especially in Palestine. I argue the so-called peace process is simply it's a colonial strategy to strengthen the structure of imperialism in the Middle East. The U.S. sought to expand its control over the Middle East by strengthening alliance with Israel and elite leaders and the Arab regimes from the mid-1970s to 2023 under the pretext of the U.S. efforts to attain peace in the region. I am trying to talk about that in order to understand the situation exactly in Palestine, because we can't, we can't achieve peace with occupation. No way to achieve peace with genocide. No peace can be achieved with ethnic cleansing. And for that, if we want to achieve peace, it is important to end the violation of human rights in the occupation. After that, we start to talk about peace. Even in South Africa, Reconciliation has been achieved after ending the apartheid regime. So it is important to understand the situation and don't think so much why Palestinians didn't accept peace. We will not accept any peace, our negative peace, without ending the occupation and achieve our political goals. This is the first point. It is important to confirm no balance between the colonial state that carrying out genocide, supported by colonial states around the world, and the people defending themselves. So this is a fact. And we are defending ourselves, and we resist the colonialism, and we have the right to resist the occupation by all means. This is important to confirm and point this point in order not to discuss and to think so much about the propaganda. They change all the facts. And we are alarmed that the Australian government has taken such an extreme position in support of Israel. The 7th of October wasn't the starting point of the conflict. The media and Western governments ignored the rules of Israeli crimes against the Palestinians for 75 years. And I will talk about the experience of my family regarding the Nakba. Dear friends and comrades, the folk of war should not cover the truth of the dangerous colonial objectives regarding the elimination of Palestinians in Gaza via carrying out ethnic cleansing and force them to leave, to go, to, in, to live in Egypt. People know, people in Gaza know about the dangerous colonial project. So the situation, yes, is bad, terrible, but it will be more terrible 
especially they trying to push people to leave Gaza, to leave, uh, to go to the south, to Khan Yunis. After Khan Yunis, we'll push them to go to Rafah, after that to go to Egypt. This ethnic cleansing, it is important. So it's important to understand why Palestinians should stay in their homes. And I will talk about my experience about that. Uh, for example, last week I watched the news that and I saw the Israeli tanks were in front of my family house in Gaza. I was so worried about my family, especially since I hadn't been in contact with them for three weeks. I didn't know anything about them. Just I saw my neighbor's hood destroyed and the tanks close to my parents' house. When I succeeded to call them, my parents, two days ago, they told me the Israeli tanks and bulldozers destroyed the wall of the door of our house, and my parents were inside while destroying the wall, and they were rescued. But when I told my parents, when I called them, I have good news, you have visa now to come to Australia, and I was happy, but unfortunately, my father told me, I don't want to leave my home. I was surprised. I know he didn't want to leave. But I told him, just you can come for one month. But he told me, let me think. And he told me, in May 1948, Zen's troops attacked the Aker village. Aker is a village in historical Palestine. And he told the guy that the civilians, old man, he is talking about his experience when he was a child. And it's a long story, but I will summarize this story. And um, then they forced his family and all the people in the village to leave this village. And he told me during we are leaving and walking, no cars, no anything. And he told me my mom was sick and she passed away and my sister passed away and then my life became terrible. And for that, I was thinking no way after that to leave my home because now if I left my home and I want to go to Khan Yunis, I should walk at least like, like uh, 10 kilometers from and I don't have ability, I don't have energy. And, and he tell me, no way to repeat this problem. I have two options, or to be alive, or I will die in my, my home. I worked for all my life to build this home. Why I leave and then some of the criminals come to take this house? Why, why, where is the world? I don't, I don't understand. I am not convinced to leave. Now I am trying to convince him to come just for 30 days. I haven't seen him for and my parents, I haven't seen them for 10 years. I hope I can succeed to convince to come at least one month. I hope he can accept that. Okay, this is, I am talking about this story because in the media, Israeli soldiers, they said, we ask people to leave because this is war. And some people think it's easy to leave. That's not accurate. Uh, evaluation is easy. It's terrible. If you left, you will not come back. It's so hard. And for that, people understand why they want people to leave. Yeah. And I am saying here, and what the people are saying in Palestine, despite the tragedy, and I am one of them, the family, my people in Palestine, when they was colonial for them to leave their homes in 1948 after carrying out massacres against civilians, just I want to confirm, we will continue to struggle against the occupation and injustice and have done so from generation to generation and Zionist movement failed to defeat the spirit of Palestinian resistance and the Palestinians will continue their struggle and we will win. I am sure about that, I am confident about that. Perhaps, perhaps some people think that is not accurate what I am saying. It is accurate. Israel failed until now to achieve any goals of its aggression in Gaza. They wanted resistance to stop, they failed. They wanted people to leave, 
Gaza to go to them, also they failed. They said we are, uh, we are fighting against Hamas. They didn't kill anyone of Hamas, just killing civilians. And it's a shame to kill civilians. Okay, regarding another point, regarding the Australian uh, position in terms of Israel has the right to defend itself. The colonial state loses the claim of right of defend itself while denying the Palestinian rights and continues its crime against civilians and its legal occupation. You can't attack people and then say, I am defending ourselves. That's not accurate, it's not correct. And if they want to defend themselves, they should not kill 20,000 of civilians. Because they are carrying out a genocide against Palestinian people in Gaza. Israel dropped more than 25 tons of explosives on the Gaza Strip since the start of aggression against Palestinians. The destructive power of explosives dropped on Gaza exceeds that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and which is a shame. And still, we find the, the international community is still silent. And there is a minister in Israeli government said, dropping nuclear bomb on Gaza is an option. That means the government discussed this option. So this is genocide. And, and when the, the media trying to say all the time, and you see well, the media is terrible, and a pressure on journalists, and they wanted stories according to the propaganda, and they wanted to justify the Israeli crimes, and I think we should focus, and we should target, and we should pressure this media, at least to be like uh, neutral, not uh, biased. And just show the, and cover the truth, not just repeat it, what Israel is saying, what Israel is claiming. And by the way, we had the protest against uh, um, ABC last week. It was good, and we will continue. <laughs> yes, we said about Israel killed 20,000, 70% of civilians. Um, uh, Another important point, Palestinian people in Gaza are not only resisting the Israeli occupation, but also colonial power around the world. For that, we should take action and boycott the Israeli colonial state and businesses that are complicit with its apartheid regime. So this is important to think how to activate BDS and start to boycott all the business support Israel. And, the, and, and I want to confirm again, under the international law, the Palestinians have the right to use resistance against an occupying power. Occupying power. This according to United Nations resolutions, especially the resolutions 3246, which is about the legitimate right of self-determination. This was confirmed in 1974, the legitimacy of people struggle for liberation from colonial, colonial uh, powers. Uh, because all the time, people are trying to describe resistance as a terrorist action, and we don't accept anyone to accuse our resistance as uh, we are defending ourselves, this is the truth. And by the way, perhaps some people are asking, okay, you are talking about international law. Yes, we are talking about, we respect international law. We should resist according to international law. We should avoid civilians, I confirm that. But when the violence like that, 20, from 75 years. Do you think people will think in wise way? This is a problem. People, the violence will create another violence. So this is in a realistic way. Perhaps you will ask me, you accept it? No, I don't accept that. But how to break the, the, the circle of violence? By ending the occupation and Palestinians should take their rights. This is the only solution. And Israel should not think that Palestinians will be accepting to use power and then we will say, give up, we will not continue a struggle occupation. No way. Palestinians are struggling from generation to generation to generation. And they said, Hamas is the main reason of the conflict now. In 1947, in 1948, there is no Hamas. 
They were civilians, just came in and they expelled Palestinians. I want to, because, um, uh, okay, okay, uh, I will, in, so finally, uh, I want to confirm Israel doesn't defend itself. Israel is carrying out genocide against Palestinian people and the civilians in Gaza. They are Israeli colonial settlers, not citizens or civilians. Don't say they, they have just, just wearing like civilian clothes in most Bank and they are not there. They are soldiers and criminals. It's settler colonialism in Gaza and Palestine, not dispute. It's Palestine, not Palestinian territories. Resistance is not terrorism. Palestinians are freedom fighters. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Shamik, uh, particularly for your identification with your parents, who uh, I remember in a picnic on the Gaza Strip tried to persuade me to go for a swim, and then your mother, with enormous generosity, complained, if you remember, that I didn't eat enough. I mean, that was <laughs> part, part of their generosity. i tell you what I want to do. I'm supposed to be talking only about the prospects for peace. I think it would be completely arrogant of me to say, to come to some sort of specific plan. I want to talk about, essentially, about a way of thinking about a peace with justice, a way of thinking for all of us, a way of thinking that really has to infect the people in Canberra and in other state capitals here and around the globe. And uh, I want to think about it in terms of a, co of a composition which you are all part of. Imagine we had the task of composing a symphony for peace that goes through several movements, and I'm going to talk about those movements. We have to start with what I would call an overture. And uh, we need to have a we need to have a theory. Can you hear me at the back? Is that okay? Yeah. We need to have a theory about peaceful in intervention. It's uh, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. We have to borrow from the peace theorists who exist, because the peace theorists identify the causes of the of the cruelty that Samar and Shemek have just identified. Starting off with the famous uh, Norwegian mathematician, of the greatest peace theorist, Johan Galton, who talked about um, structural violence, which applies very directly to the situation of the Palestinian people for 75 years. Structural violence were those, a reference to those structures that denied lifetime opportunities for half of the people of a population, of, of, of a country. So uh, that's of particular relevance if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the Balfour Declaration of, uh, of 1917, that promised a homeland for the Jews, but not at the expense of the indigenous people of Palestine. And then, uh, as my wonderful yes. friend Peters reminded me, almost immediately the British Balfour and Co. published correspondence saying they didn't care at all about the 700,000 Arabs, they called them at that time. Uh, so, going into peace negotiations without the idea of rectifying the massive inequalities determined by structural violence would be like going onto a stage without knowing your script. The second theorist is um, actually derived from a wonderful but um, often easily forgotten Australian, a man called John Burton, who was a, who was a diplomat, a practitioner of conflict resolution, a, a prolific author of books about how to resolve national and international conflicts. His essential theories, theory applied to peace was about the need to meet people's universal human needs. What he showed was that if there was a misfit between universal human needs and the means of meeting them, then that was a guarantee of violence, that people, anybody would go to enormous lengths to meet those needs by hunger strikes, by suicide bombing and so on. And if you think of the way in which forbidding water, food, fuel, medical supplies to go to the people of Gaza, you'll see the relevance of his theory about the need to meet universal human needs. The third theorist I want to refer to is the um, 
uh, Israeli, uh, Israeli American anthropologist Jeff Harper, who talks about the inclu please remind everybody about the inclusiveness of universal human rights. Without, without that, you, you are lost. So that's, those are the theories, that's the language you need to arm yourself before you move to what I would call the second movement. Now in symphonies, usually you get somewhat doer second movements, a kind of rumble, a lot of double bass, a lot of timpani. And the first, that, that movement is, for me is about this recitation of the great panacea that everybody's being told about. Everybody's an authority on it. It's called the state. The state. You hear it every, every day. One state, two states, dominion of states, any old state. Nobody, nobody raises the question, who is to be included in that state and who is to be excluded? Because would you be including the right of return of all refugees? Would you be ensuring that women under uh, Resolution 1325 of the United Nations have as, have, are, are the um, major leaders in the construction of a, of a new state? And who, who in this state will be representing the thousands and thousands of traumatized children in, 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 the, in the Gaza Strip? So the, in a way, in these negotiations, in this movement, the only state that exists is called humanity. The issue for the next six months, at least minimum, is the state of humanity. And on those grounds, you would have to argue, and from my point of view, under a, a principle called the responsibility to protect, which, the, which if the um, Australian government discovered a slight bit of courage, could, be, could, be insist, they could insist on the construction of a peace force to go almost immediately to the West Bank to stop the slaughter that's going. That's the first, if you say that the state, the only state that matters is the state of humanity, you'd have to say that the priority initiative in the next few weeks is to send a peace force to the West Bank. Okay, that's the, that's the, that's the, um, the that, that's the next movement. The next movement is called the inequality of power. If you don't address the inequality of power, even if you intervene in, in, in disputes of domestic violence, which are directly analogous to what's going on in, in Gaza, but well, it's, it, it, it's, it's a million times worse. Israel has been allowed by the connivance of Western governments to, to have all the, the, power, the military power, the economic power, the diplomatic power, They've also been allowed to dominate the narrative. The kind of story that Samar just told is not allowed to be heard and that, that, that Shalik has just told. So the domination of the narrative by, by our Western media, that's a cue for my colleague Jake to pop up and down in a minute, um, that, that, the, the notion that you can see it in a way, and I'm not taking any risk here, by the advertisement in the Sydney Morning Herald today, you think that the only issue is about anti-Semitism. <laughs> what about anti-Palestinianism? What about the, the fascists in the government of Netanyahu who are, who are asking for the Palestinian, for the people of Gaza to be eliminated? It would be, some of those ministers have said, it would be a moral duty. Now, if anybody said that slightly about any one Jewish citizen, there would be, there would be hell to pay. So, the... The, the dealing with the imbalance of power is crucial. I want to talk a little bit here about what uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, Richard Falk and Sari Makdisi, called soft power. Um, Falk, who was the, for years, was the, um, the, uh, the special raconteur for the occupied territories under the authority of the United Nations, says, Look, don't hesitate to pick up the telephone. Don't forget the, the power of dialogue. Don't forget the power of informality. Don't, don't eliminate that, those ideas from your political thought. I'm, I'm just reminding myself, I'm trying to talk about a way of thinking about this. Not, not all the, the, the I's and the T's, the I's dotted and the T's crossed of a, of a um, plan. MacDesey says that, um, the Palestinians often underestimate the amount of power they could generate. 
And in that respect, if, if you look at <laughs> if you if you look at the if you look at the millions around the world demonstrating um, for to free free Palestine, you'd have to wonder how can that be harnessed subsequently. It would be a terrible shame if we heard no more from those protesters once the, once the so-called war ends. So that 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 soft power is 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 crucial, and soft power in a way was expressed. In, in Samar's beautiful poetry. That uh, Makdisi argues, look, don't be preoccupied with the negotiation in the conference room and the battlefield. Don't forget the power of the ideals and ideas of, of curiosity and imagination. And he refers, as I often uh, do to, to the national poet of, um, of, uh, of, of Palestine who, who wrote that um, uh, we travel like other people, but we return to nowhere. Our traveling is the way of the clouds. We have a country of words, speak, speak, so we may know the end of this travel. So that brings me to the, the last but one movement in this composition. And it's about who are the players in this orchestra? Who is going to be allowed to speak? Because if we, if we, if we only invite the same old men, the same old diplomats and politicians who've caused all the problems for the past 75 years, we'll, and, his, and the international relations boys, they're mostly boys, <coughs> call it real politique. Right? They think that they, that it used to be called, I um, uh, forget now, some, some sort of very positive conservative theory about, about the nation state. If they are invited, the people who've, whose format for living has failed because it has given the Israelis a blank check to do what they like, then, then we'll get nowhere. I just want to mention some of the people who should be invited to play in the, in the orchestra. I mean, this, in, 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 in all sorts of worlds, if you have a huge diversity of people, you multiply the number, the imagination, and the number, the number of ideas, the number of opportunities. Why wouldn't we include the, palace, the grassroots Palestinian um, Israeli women called Women Wage Peace? It matches the Resolution 1325. And the equivalent Palestinian women called Women of the Sun, a grassroots group. Or the, or the uh, Jewish Palestinian group called um, uh, living together, working together, who incidentally are concerned not only about peace and justice and equality, but about justice for a precious environment. They argue, and look at the amazing damage not only to the to the, the complete destruction of the of the cities in Gaza, but look what we've done. Look at what has happened to the to the environment. So you'd have to include those people in the in the. Uh, deliberations about peace. Now, the as with any as with any symphony, you need to have a crescendo at the end that makes people go away feeling happy, or at least slightly optimistic. In this case, and for me, that's what I would what we have to move towards is what I would call some crescendo for humanity. We have to talk about that constantly. Otherwise, all we're talking about is how many tanks, how many guns. How many people have been killed? It's always this fascination with violence dominates the agenda and thinking. So here's the crescendo for humanity, and some of it's already been mentioned. Uh, in, in a way, it has to do with the interpretation of words, because the Israelis are totally preoccupied with retribution, with re revenge. It's all about revenge. And we have to replace revenge with the notion of justice. You know, the wonderful, the wonderful German playwright and poet Bertolt Brechtson said, tried to teach us, justice is the bread of the people. Just as, da just as um, daily bread is necessary, so is daily justice. And then he said, it is even necessary several times a day. Why, why aren't we hearing that in Canberra? Instead of instead, you know, ducking behind their sofas to avoid them voting for a, um, for, uh, for, for a ceasefire. When 139 
yeah, when 139 nations have voted for to um, support the, the, the state of Palestine, um, why are we still ducking for cover? Last two points in the if you know, crescendo for humanity. Um, we, we really, in a way, we don't have to invent anything. We just have to say, please abide by the rules of international law. International law says you can't attack hospitals. It says you can't murder children. You can't deny them the means of a livelihood. So adherence to international law is crucial. The third, the final point, and this is the final drum roll, which I, you know, play with a tuba, I think, would be about the phrase that Samar used, that this phrase, um, from the river to the sea, you know, when we go on the, the marches, people say, people are chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The media and the, the, the Israeli lobby immediately says that's a statement about the elimination of Israel. My colleague, um, Gershon Baskin, who's quite a conservative columnist for, Ju for the Jerusalem Post, writes, no, that's from the river to the sea actually means that everybody has the same right to the same rights. So you can see how they can be turned around. <laughs> Murphy. And what I want to say is uh, I'm a member of the Media Alliance and I, I signed on a letter two days ago, I think, maybe three, um, of journalists asking that the editorial management of their uh, publications be more rigorous in the coverage of this conflict. For instance, don't accept the IDF media statements as fact. You must fact check them before you use them. Um, and don't say it started on October 7th. Tell the real context. So the management of uh, Age and uh, Sydney Morning Herald have banned all the, all the journalists who signed from reporting on this conflict. So, so there's a point of resistance here and we, we have to build on it. And the second one was just in the paper this morning that three of the performers at the Seagull came out wearing a Christian. And... Uh, but the management of the Sydney Theatre Company said they're treating this as a human resources issue. That's code for we're going to sack them. They're getting replaced. Yeah, so um, I don't know how that's going to play out, but it's really fantastic that people are standing up and expressing themselves for the human values we're here about tonight. Okay, so with the questions, I don't know how we go with the big crowd here and uh, moving the microphone around. We've only got this microphone. So um, I'm going to give the first question to Jake Lynch and Stephen Langford, wherever he is, is going to carry the microphone around. If it gets too difficult, we'll ask people to queue up. But he, okay, Jake. Thanks, Peter. So my question is this. There is not a single federal electorate in Greater Sydney where Labour either holds the seat or depends on the seat for its majority in the House of Representatives, or is a credible contender to take the seat, where the votes of pro-Israel supporters would swing the contest either way. All those votes are now concentrated in areas such as the eastern suburbs and the North Shore, which are either safe liberal constituencies or contested with the Teals. On the other hand, there is at least one seat in Greater Sydney, that of Watson, just to the west of here, and probably several others too, where Labour depends on the votes of Palestinians, people of Palestinian heritage, people from Arabic communities and communities of colour. Isn't it time, did you see what I did there, <laughs> to say to the Australian Labour Party, you can either have your support for Israeli war crimes and crimes against humanity, or you can win these seats and keep your majority in the House of Representatives, but not both. <laughs> If you would like any, any comments on this? Okay, the next one is from Joffrey, and then... Oh. Uh, first, oh, I, I'm Joffrey Baldry, and my, I, I appreciate the conclusion of Zero Degrees makes an follow up for that, because I believe that Gaza has enormous <coughs> economic opportunities that not many people are aware of. They have access to Leviathan, the Leviathan, uh, mineral gas fields, which can easily eliminate poverty. There, are, there have been plans to build a, a canal 
parallel to the Suez, which will perform even better than the Suez. And there are plans of an India, Middle East, European economic corridor where everyone, including the West Bank, will benefit with proper infrastructure and proper fiscal and monetary policies. And so I would say this, that if you were to pursue a peace plan, there has to be money behind it. And I'd say the opportunities that I mentioned will be more than enough for everyone, Palestinian and Israeli, to share. And I think this should be put on the table. This should be, there should be an account. There should be systems in which the benefits of such plans will be shared justly between the people of the Holy Land. Thank you. I look, I don't disagree with you except that the one of the big conundrums in every piece of foreign policy is where trade pitches itself against human rights. And usually, usually the advocates of trade and the economic benefits ride roughshod over the respect for human rights. So, uh, and there's got to be massive intervention from Western governments have got to stop their hypocrisy and to let alone support the, um, the economic development of a new of rebuilding Gaza, but must insist on universal human rights. Can I just say? Also, I think we have to really uh, not uh, disappear the agency and the voice of the Palestinians in this whole story. Um, when we're talking about the sharing of the land, for example, which land are we talking about? I mean, this is something I strongly believe, and I, you know, I believe in a way one state solution from the river to the sea. But currently, what is happening is is the separation of Gaza as a as a single entity, almost like a country that being being warred on by Israel. And you know, to talk about sharing the resources in Gaza with who? With the occupier? who sucked its water dry for decades, um, who starved its children, who stole the electricity. I think it's a great idea for the long-term discussions, for sure. But before we get there, we need, we need, first of all, to end the apartheid, to end the system that gives full privilege to people just because they're Jewish on that land and strips the basic human rights from non-Jews. So we have to collapse that system. We have to end the occupation. And then we have to come to some kind of a truth and reconciliation process. And it's through that process that we can talk about the sharing of the land and the moving forward. Um, and that brings me to something that Stuart said before we took the break and when he was talking about the wonderful cars for, for peace building. Um, and then you were mentioning uh, having all these uh, groups being part of uh, the process, right? The, the, the Jewish-Palestinian peace groups. Uh, and my question here, and it's just a question because we're really far from, from that point, but I'd like to think that uh, that I'm putting this question, that, that we, we need to think about it, is, is again, it's about Palestinian agency. The Jews are not currently um, in Palestine struggling for their liberation and their rights. It's the Palestinians who are in the struggle for rights and liberation, and the Jewish people who are walking with them, are walking in solidarity. Uh, and I think it's important to have that central to our minds when we when we try to imagine. That's something that Jeff Helper doesn't do. Um, and I, I, I think he's an incredible personality and he's done great work. But sometimes you can have a blind spot, and that blind spot is just that, you know, you, you've got to let the Palestinians take the lead because this is their liberation movement. You're not the one who's being liberated, although you will be liberated through that process yourself. I think, you know, oppressor and oppressed become liberated uh, at the end of this process. But, uh, but to be absolutely mindful of that. Hi, I'm Vivian Forgeot. I'd like to take the opportunity of welcoming Ludovico Fabiano here tonight. Now, Ludovico, with his colleague Dominic Weikanak, bravely, bravely stood up. 
bravely stood up for the right, for, for, for principle, for humanity, against a, a very vicious campaign. And still, you've had most, almost all your roles stripped from you, both of you. And um, we're sorry for that, but we applaud your courage and integrity. Hello, my name is Khaled. I'm from Palestine Action Group, who are doing the rallies every weekend in Sydney. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your speaker. I want to say something. Is Palestine just need human aids? You think Palestinians are just like poor people looking for like uh, food and water and fuel? I can I can tell you no. Palestinian people built all the Middle East. All the Gulf area was built by Palestinians, we are educated, we are rich people. We need political solution, we need to get our political solution, and this is a human rights. To get our, our uh, political uh, solution is a human rights, and we can do this by negotiation. If not, we have the right to resist against occupation, even if it's armed struggle. And all our Jewish comrades supporting us in this, because this government in Israel and this Zionist movement are extremely against the Palestinian and the Jews for peace. Thank you very much. I'm trying to answer or to comment about what Khalid said. When Israel and started to cut off electricity and medicine and food, and water. The question why they wanted to start negotiation with Palestinians on food and also they wanted to make Gaza unlivable and people in trying to push people to leave Gaza. So when we see the situation in the media, how they enter the food, medicine, the situation is terrible. Because Palestinians are not struggling for get food and medicine. We are struggling in order to end occupation. So this is what I am trying to say, that, that food and medicine is imp are important for a human rights. So this is the responsibility about the international community to provide food, medicine, and should it prevent Israel to cut this food and to cut electricity and also communication and internet. Ambulances don't, can't go to rescue people because there is no internet, no communication. And this is important. Yes, our issue is not humanitarian, it is political, but the situation is terrible in Gaza. And, and I agree about Khalid, this is what we are seeing, is not the only demands of Palestinians. We want to end this genocide and to stop this aggression against Palestinians, and we want, as a Palestinians, to have the right to resist occupation and self-determination, and we should not accept anyone trying to impose solution by saying we want uh, international uh, forces to come, we want uh, Palestinians who decide, not anyone can decide, not uh, America, not United States, uh, not uh, Britain, we have the right to, to decide about our fate. This is what I am saying and I am confirming. Yes, we want to end the occupation. We want to end genocide. We want to stop colonial objectives against Palestinians. We want to protect the human rights. These are our demands. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joel Laurie. I'm the editor of Consortium News. I'm from New York City and I just heard that it's I disagree with what you said. You said it's not up to America, it's up to Britain. You it's not up to America. I'm here to say that it is up to America, my country. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. It's the only way this genocide will stop immediately is if the United States, if Biden tells Netanyahu, enough. It's enough. No yes. more money, no more weapons tomorrow. Yeah. It ends. Like what is the only way? <laughs> what's the only way Biden would say that to Netanyahu? Yeah. What's the only way the US Congress would cut off those funds at $14 billion. Is if they realize they have a political cost to pay. Yeah. Biden has an election next year. Congress knows that without the support of the American people, Biden knows without the American people, 
He could not continue this. And guess what? To their credit, the American people aren't as dumb and as out of, out of touch as a lot of people think, including me. They have been marching and demonstrating in the streets every weekend, like everywhere else in the world, and a group of Jews, American Jews, took over Grand Central Station in New York. You don't think Joe Biden, Tony Blinken see this? Guess who else sees this? Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu, who grew up, who went to high school in Philadelphia, who went to university in Massachusetts, who is the U Israeli ambassador to the UN and lived in New York, who speaks English with an American accent, unlike Mark Regev, his spokesman who speaks with a Melbourne accent. He's American. He is an American. He understands the American mentality. That's why this four-day pause happened to coincide with a four-day holiday in the United States called Thanksgiving, which is the most important holiday. You think that's a coincidence? Of course, you don't understand that outside the U.S., but Netanyahu understands the American psychology, American culture. He knows how important that holiday is. It's a holiday in which American people visit their families and usually argue over politics and watch the news critically. They've stopped working for a few days and begin to relax and think. This was the time for Netanyahu to tell the Americans, I'm on your side, and guess what? He put out a video about Thanksgiving, a message to the American people. This is very cynical. He knows without the American people, this war is lost for Israel, and the only force in the world that can stop it is the American people. Thank you. I just want to make a comment about how the people of Australia should respond. And I want to use, respond to that excellent contribution from the floor, from, from New York, uh, by, talk, by talking quickly about the brave conduct of school children mm -hmm. who left their classrooms to, rep to say no to the occupation, no to genocide, free Palestine. And the establishment interests of Australia said, no, you should be back in your classrooms. You should be ignoring, ignoring the genocide. You should not be learning about human rights. So you had this complete mismatch between elderly official uh, opinion, which has gone on for 75 years. You, you had it writ large in the response to the kids who came out to protest, who said, we know something about the future. See, young people knew something about the future. We ain't going to put up with this anymore. And what did the politicians say? Get back to your classroom. It's nothing to do with you. So it's that, that's the mismatch that we have to address. We have to tell the politicians and the public and the people who run the media that this, that the, the murder, the mass murder, the genocide of um, over 13,000 people is what the issue is about. The, the mass murder, the, the crescendo after the 75 years of um, other slaughters. Yes, my name is Fabio Pavadini. Um, just a question, uh, a clarification. Uh, I'm finding it strange that uh, we're talking about uh, a ceasefire. And uh, is this a, a ceasefire only for the Gaza Strip? Or is it a ceasefire for the rest of the country? Because uh, the war is still going on, they're still killing people in the, in the um, West Bank. On the West Bank, you know. North but, so, and in the north of Gaza. but that is something that is not very clear. I mean, uh, well, I missed a point, but the media it doesn't talk about this thing. We're talking about oh, all these people being freed. You know, they're freeing people. They're arresting more. You know, it doesn't make sense. Could you give your opinion on Qatar's role in this process, please? I've met with the Hamas leadership on a couple of occasions, both of them in Qatar, in, in, in Doha. So they've been, uh, they've been patrons of Hamas. Um, they, are, they are clearly uh, incredibly significant in the, in the um, conversations with Hamas. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi's tried to teach all of us that it's easy to uh, have a conversation with your friends. The real test is whether you have a conversation with your enemies. But in the wisdom of, uh, the wisdom of the Western governments, they told people like me, you're a terrorist for even try going to speak to them. You, you, shouldn't, you, sh you, com you committed an offense for speaking to them. In other words, we, we believe in democracy, but we only talk to certain people. So I don't know, um, have I missed the point? 
Yeah, it's about the Qatar's role. Oh, well, yeah. Look, the Qatar has facilitated the conversation. I mean, you'd have to say that so far, the, the uh, protection of the hostages, the release of the hostages, has been, has been somewhat impressive. In, in a small piece of land that has been bombed into oblivion, they're still managing to, to, have, uh, to keep the deal. Because basically we've said they're, 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 they're terrorists. They're the only terrorists in Palestine. They're, only, they're the only terrorists in the last 75 years, right? That's, that, <laughs> so uh, Qatar has given them a kind of legitimacy by saying, yes, they're here, we trust them, they keep their word. Uh, and frequently, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the previous ceasefires in, in um, 2008, 9, 2012, 13, that were, where the deals were not kept by the Israelis, you'd have the question about, well, who keeps their word? But you no, know, the Qataris are significant. My name's Tony Lennart. I actually train rebels and terrorists as well as vice presidents, as well as generals, to put themselves in the shoes of others, to see things from other people's perspective so they can actually end the wars. And we've had some pretty amazing success with that. So when I look at the situation with Israel and Palestine, it does appear that there's a lot more support now for Palestine than in the past given that social media, etc., is giving the chance to bypass the mainstream media and the sort of oppression that uh, has been talked about. So first of all, I'd be interested in how much that has increased in your mind. And then the second thing is, is there a way maybe that we can somehow shift the conversation so it's not so much pro-Palestine, which is terrific and wonderful, but it sounds to many Jewish people like if you say I'm pro-England's footy, that you're saying you're against Aussie, uh, the Aussie team, yeah, the Wallabies. And um, so is there a way that we can kind of make it more a peace march, a peace protest, uh, such that the politicians feel a bit safer to really support it, such that more Jewish people come out to support it, and such that maybe um, the, the Jewish people themselves who, alongside uh, Palestinians, are highly traumatized and are operating from a place of reaction from the amygdala, such that they might maybe see it as, oh, we have partners rather than increasing opposition. I just want to first answer to the Qatar question, uh, Qatar comment, which uh, I just want to say that Qatar also plays a major role in the information about this war. Uh, because it funds and maintains and hasn't shut down yet Al Jazeera. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't for Al Jazeera, we wouldn't know half as much, if not even less, as we do now. Um, and I know that in those dark days when we completely lost contact with our family, it was Al Jazeera reporters on the ground that were telling us where the bombing was, blow by blow, in which street and which families. Um, and so that role is heroic and is impressive and, uh, and I just wanted to, to point to it because whenever we speak about Qatar, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. I know how much pressure they've been under to shut it down. As for the pro-Palestine, pro-Israel, pro-peace, pro-justice, um, I think it's all it's all fine, and it's it's a it's an interesting theory and an interesting way to look at things. And but but I am you know 75 years of erasure. I tend to kind of feel bad when somebody says when somebody tries to raise the word Palestine. The fact is Palestine is being erased, and we as Palestinians are constantly have to fight for our Palestinian identity. And it's something that a lot of people may not understand but it's a difficult daily struggle. Even when we do simple things, I'm a playwright, and I wrote a play uh, about my, my family's experience during Kaslet in Gaza. And it was a love story with uh, the happenings in the backgrounds. It was not political at all. Maybe some of you here have seen that play. But the fact that I wrote a play about a Palestinian love story meant that I had to put up leading up to opening night with weeks of pressure from the Israeli um, lobby to have the play removed from the, uh, the VCE playlist, to have the play shut down, 
to be called anti-Semitic, and then to be told exactly what I just heard, although I know you didn't mean it. Why not write about something that represents both sides? It's not my job, I'm sorry. I don't need to include a Jewish voice in my, in my play about a Palestinian love story. And when I'm being erased, and there are people marching in the street saying, free Palestine, that's actually called solidarity, and, and it is a really important thing, and I would hate to see that go away, uh, or being obscured by anything else. We, we can do the, the peace thing, and we've done it for a very long time, but we cannot stop calling this for what it is. It is a solidarity with the Palestinian people struggle for liberation. That's what this movement is about. If my response is, I want to make a healthcare analogy. If I have suspicion of a cancer, and I go to a cancer specialist and said, well, that, that's the secondary there. I need to know where the primary site is. And the primary site of the cancer in international relations has been the failure to solve, to address justice for the Palestinian people. That, that has metastasized massive conflicts around the world for years and years and years. That, that, apart from anything else, is another reason why that has to stay the issue. I mean, when people like Peter and myself used to write about justice for uh, the Palestinians, we'd be told, well, why are, you, why, are you, um, why are you selecting Israel? Why are you being punitive or critical of Israel? I used to say, well, yeah, but we're writing, we're in Sri Lanka as well, dealing with the Tamils, we're in West Papua as well, dealing with that, uh, those people being um, taken over. There are, we're in Myanmar as well, but we shouldn't have to do that. I mean, the issue is about universal human rights. The issue is about justice for the Palestinians. One last comment. There's one big leveler in all of this that's going to have to be introduced in um, peace negotiations. It's the, it's the violence associated with, with climate change. Just, uh, it's not about pro-Palestinians or pro-Israelis. It is important to say international law should be respected. This is the main issue here. We should not just talk about and to find or to think about excuse or of genocide or ethnic cleansing, of Nakba, of occupation. We should stop thinking in this way. We should say occupation should be ended. Genocide should be stopped. If they wanted to live in Palestine, they should integrate with Palestinians. The problem is not about Jewish or about anything like that. From the beginning, they didn't accept it. They didn't accept to integrate with Palestinians. This colonial project established to replace Palestinians. So we should understand the context. So integration is big different from coming and invade and like expel Palestinians. So if we want to achieve peace, we should live together in a democratic state. This is important. And by, by the way, PLO in 1969, they accepted one state solution. Unfortunately, the world didn't support it. And the pressure, and the pressure PLO until we now in this situation about Palestinian Authority. Even two states solution, they, they refused. They didn't want to achieve peace. They are not coming to achieve peace. Can I, can I and, and, and also regarding Qatar, for me personally, I don't trust any Arab regimes. <laughs> I don't trust them. They are a part of colonialism in the Middle East. Everyone has rule and task. All of them. If Qatar is good with Palestinians, I am sure they will not support Qatar or cooperate with Qatar directly. They don't. I'm not sure what is the rule of Qatar. Sometimes it's good, I feel, but sometimes I'm suspicious. So, I am not sure because according to the colonialism, they wanted to make alliance with the elite leaders everywhere. They have a strong relation with Saudi Arabia, and, and at the same time, at the same time, they said, we don't support uh, dictatorial regime. We support democracy. <laughs> And they support Saudi Arabia. They support Saudi Arabia when they were bombing Yemen. 
They support Israel when they are bombing the March of Return, which was peaceful, peaceful rallies. So the idea is structure of colonialism. Structure is not Israel, it's structure of colonialism. There is no religion for this colonialism. This colonialism was formed by alliance with Israeli leaders, Americans, and colonial uh, powers around the world, and Arab regimes. So this is the situ situation. So we're not talking about conflict between Jewish and Muslims, not to do. This is fake. We should understand this context. Yeah, thank you. Uh, George, uh, I too signed a petition from any delay that Peter also signed. Um, we talked about the last few weeks and all the violence and distress that we see on TV. Um, I guess I want to know from our Palestinian friends. Um, I stumbled across a clip on YouTube the other day uh, from, I think his name is Ghassan Kanafani. He's a liberator. And he made a point, um, he'd never seen a conversation between a clip. The sort of, yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> a colonialist power and a liberation movement. And as you said, he likened it to the sword in the neck. We've seen this conflict go on for 75 years, 75 years of oppression of Palestinian people. How do we move past that to get peace, Palestinian sovereignty, and is it as simple as removing Netanyahu and Hamas from the picture? Thank you. Ah, oh, that's the easiest. <laughs> Please, let me solve that one for you. <laughs> I think, um, your, your name was? George. George. George, when he um, spoke about the U.S. And, and the importance of that law that the Biden administration and other U.S. administrations have played before in propping up the Israeli military system. Um, I think there is, there is, um, there's a lot of power there and I don't think I don't think any form of direct resistance on the ground uh, is going to do anything. I do believe that change is going to come from the outside. I do believe that uh, people power is going to increase and that the movement for Palestinian human rights will continue to grow. And I do believe that this will translate to political capital, and then we will see um, uh, countries one after the other. Um, holding Israel to account. We're already seeing a lot of um, legal cases being put out uh, against uh, governments everywhere. Uh, we also Murad Murad Akhat uh, talking about uh, the, the legal cases in in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, taking leaders, uh, holding leaders to account for supporting war crimes and genocide. We know that there are cases happening in this country, and I think. I think it will take time, but all these grassroots movements and this massive people power that we're seeing on the streets, it will translate to political capital and that day will come. I would like to remind you, when Yasser Arafat, the president of PLO, accepted the peaceful solution and he accepted 22% of the size of historical of Palestine. After that, they didn't end the occupation, and the, the Israeli extremist groups kept its Rabin, the former Israeli Prime Minister, and they killed Yasser Arafat. The idea, we are talking about structure, is not about person like Netanyahu or groups, or, we're talking about structure of colonialism. This structure should be ended. This is the idea. Zionism should not continue colonialism of Palestine. We want to achieve democratic state, as what happened in uh, South Africa. When the uh, apartheid regime was ended, everything became okay and there was reconciliation. This is the most important point, and we should focus about how to end the structure of imperialism. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I like the point about the political capital, and I want to pick up on that. But it seems to me in Australia, we've just experienced the referendum, and probably a lot of us were shocked by that outcome. And at the same time, then, we're dealing with um, an Australian public who often are prepared to accept anything they're told about Palestine and watch the news 
through what the Israeli um, government is saying. So, my question to the three of you is, what hope to educate the Australian population about this? Because if you're as old as me, you got taught Australia was an empty land, and you had to relearn your history after you went to school. And I think many people have the wrong impression about Palestine um, and they need to relearn that history and they're not in school. Long term we might make sure our education curriculums deal with um, a more balanced view. But what do we do with the people who have left school, who go, we need to put pressure we need to understand, we need to relearn. And so my question to the three of you, where do we go with the Australian public? Because this cause will always be led by Palestinians, but if we're going to change the way Australia reacts, we need to educate Australians. I don't think there's any chance with people of my age group. I think the, uh, because this, this age group have caused all the problems. You're right, Don. I mean, the best thing we ever did when we created the Sydney Peace Foundation uh, 25 years ago was to make alliances with high schools, in particular a high school in the western suburbs called Cabramatta High School that had about 1,200 kids from about 50 different uh, denominations, ethnic groups, many of whom were graduates of Villawood after we, because we're part of our greeting to, welcome to Australia, we stuck them in a detention centre. I bet it's, so it's that, young, it's that generation, it's those young people and their hopes for the future, the sort of kids who are demonstrating in the streets, they're, they're the crucial ones. I mean, the big danger at the moment, and these are the, the, um, the mostly old men whom I have coffee with at 6.30 in the morning, they say, look, I can't stand this anymore, I just switch off, I'm going to turn it off, I can't face it anymore. I wanted, the real dilemma for me is whether or not to get an electric car. And that, so you have to overcome the fight. That's the overcome the fatalism that you can't do anything. So my my hope is is with that younger generation, and it's at least one of those only here tonight. That's so optimistic. <laughs> so uh, I'm a mother of a Gen Z, and I'm hoping that we can change the way we think. Uh, look, uh, things are, are uh, different for the, the new generation, for sure. They're getting their information not from mainstream anymore. Um, you know, I, I, I look at, uh, at newspapers that have their articles behind the paywall. That just basically means uh, for 50 plus year olds only. Uh, anybody who's under <laughs> that age group is not going to pay for that article. So, how do we educate them? I think. We, we need to parent, and parent as well as we can. We need to, um, because at the end of the day, they're not getting their education uh, from, the, from the old ways that we thought that they were, like textbooks. No, they're on social media, and we need to know how they can think critically on social media. Put their I, I, you know, Israeli army videos with the curtain saying, that's where they used to shoot the videos for the hostages. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I'm rambling, but there's, there's no one fix for it, but we just have to educate. Hi, I'm Vivian again. Look, I think, uh, in response to Sandra, I think she's much too uh, pessimistic. I mean, for many years now, in, in polls that have been taken, the, uh, the general populace in Australia has favoured Palestine over Israel. The issue is to activate that. And I think what we're seeing in the streets now, there's so much activism. The school kids on strike for Palestine. I mean, that is extraordinary. Everywhere, all over the place, you know, like people, you know, putting their, their kafirs on at, at ceremonies and so on. There's a huge change going on. And I think we've got to really surf that wave. Can I just add very quickly? I just really hope Peter Dutton continues to tell kids in schools not to be a <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, be patient. We've got two more only. I'm going to stop the questions then and uh, really congratulate everybody for sticking with it. Um, it's been a really wonderful uh, discussion tonight already. So let's, let's just keep going. Oh, hi, my Good name is Maggie. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the, the from the river to the sea, um, Palestine will be free. Whenever I've heard that, I've always assumed it to be free of occupation. But I have heard this um, a, a lecture by an American woman, and her main point is that, make no mistake, when they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, they mean free of Jews. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let me get that. Very quickly, in under a minute, I will explain this one. So, uh, from the river to the sea is a chant that originated uh, in the end of the 1960s when the Palestine Liberation Organization was formed. At the time, in the PLO Charter was the vision of what we see our future Palestinian state would look like. And that vision was one secular democratic state for all three religions where Jews, Muslims and Christians can live in peace and in equality. I grew up with that. I could recite it. My, my father would have me recite it. That's the kind of uh, discourse that we grew up with. That chant disappeared when Oslo began because we had to now shift from believing that we can share the land with Muslims, Christians, and Jews, the one state from the river to the sea, and that we had to contend with the 1967 border, which is a small portion of historic Palestine. So that chant disappeared and we started chanting, and the occupation now. You would not hear from the river to the sea for almost 20 years during the whole Oslo um, thing. The chant came back, uh, I think, around the beginning of the siege of Gaza, uh, and it came back because people started to believe that there is no two states, Israel made that impossible, and that the only thing left for us to believe in now is, that, again, one secular democratic state for all three religions where Jews, Muslims, and Christians can live together in peace and in equality. Check it out, look it up. It is in the PLO's original charter from the 1960s. My name is Bafa Hamari. I'm Ms. Rebota. I'm a political mom for the kids. Journalists have been targeted lately very badly, and they give like over 60 journalists been bad in Palestine. So some of us here, even in Australia, have been targeted as well. They don't want us to publish the truth the way it is. It has to be always somehow uh, monopolized. How can we get protected? other than send a complaint to the MEWA. For example, myself, I'm losing my job lately for this. How can we protect it to save my spot? Thank you. Well, you know in your case you, that I tried to protest on your behalf. That was one thing. The other key issue is that the most obscene word that's used by journalists by, by the people who run newspapers, it's called balance. They always want balance. There is no balance. There is massive inequality and massive injustice. So the, the most obscene word to use about the Palestinian-Israeli uh, colonization is, is balance. And you, you've suffered from that by, saying, by, by courageously saying, I'm, there's no balance. I want to talk about imbalance. That's what you, why you were penalised. But you know, I'm happy for you to, you know, to jump up and down and say and, and, and make a noise on your behalf. But that's only uh, look. Many of us wrote immediately to Patricia Carvalis and the ABC after the appalling behaviour of the uh, on the Q and A program when when our friend Nasser Mashni was basically prosecuted. And uh, Francesca Albanese, the United Nations representative, was studiously ignored. Yeah. And there was a, a massive grub groveling to the only Israeli representative. That's what happened. So we, we have to be outraged. If, you're not, if you don't um, express outrage in the, at the injustice, you lose touch with your own humanity. That's a, that refers to all of us. 
I think this is not personal problem. This is our duty to pressure the media to give good media coverage according to peace journalism, give the voices for victims, for the people, for the children. <coughs> they should not excuse crimes, they should not excuse the genocide, they should not pressure journalists. They are human beings, they wanted to show how the people are suffering. We should start campaign to pressure the media. We should not accept to exchange the facts. And I think still we have weaknesses about targeting or pressuring the media. I think it is important to think how to support Palestine by pressuring the media. And for me, I will start to think and I will work and I will continue. Media should not be biased in this way. The journalists should be human beings. The, the journalists should support human rights. We are talking, we are pro-human rights before to be supporting Palestine. Excuse me, Shami, you've got to finish your PhD first. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. You haven't finished yet? <laughs> it's too busy. <laughs> I stopped now. I stopped because the war of Gaza. And I said that. <laughs> I stopped because they're part time. I said, I said we were finishing here, but there's one more person who wants to ask a question. Is that okay? Will there be? Yeah! Yes, I'm going to do it. I'm Michael Patrick. My question relates to the presence, or the hypothetical presence, of the Israeli security apparatus in the Western countries. Maybe even Australia. Huh. Um, during during the, uh, the government of Julia Gillard, there was an a Israeli um, agent of Mossad removed from this country. At that time, a friend of mine was undergoing a quite a bit of surveillance by that particular fellow. Now, I know that because his photo was on the front page of the Australian, and I witnessed the harassment my friend was getting firsthand. Um, my friend did a lot of activities, like, for instance, uh, taking a major talkback radio station in Sydney around about the time of that event that Georgia Gillard government was telling a particular Israeli agent from Australia. He took my friend took the the radio station. I think it was to the administrative services tribunal um, on the grounds that they had tried to establish during one late night talkback program that various Muslim groups in Australia were involved in activities like hiding arms beneath the floorboards of mosques. Of course the radio station turned up with uh, a bevy of barristers and supporting counsel and he had no chance. He had he didn't have the funds to have his own counsel. But, yeah, so my, my question is, to your knowledge, is, is that organisation, the Mossad, or some other Israeli security organisation established in Australia today? Sure. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm certainly ACO and ASIS would be would be uh, in regular communication with them because they all think the same way. It's a and bit they've like signed agreements. They, they, the, they've signed those same yeah. agreements about the, the agreements that we have with them um, with with AUKUS. Yeah. But underpinning this, there's another big issue, and I, in a way, we've all used, I've used the word structure. It's a bit of an academic. To work, a word is the fascination with the arms industry. That's what the the, the and Australia's collusion with the arms industry. I mean, people are only being wiped out because of the manufacture of missiles and bombs and tanks and so on. It's this fascination with violence is the way to go. And our signing up to AUKUS agreement because we desperately need uh, eight nuclear submarines in order to feel secure. I mean. That's, it's that completely destructive way of thinking that is also 
underpinning the the uh, the, the spying apparatus. Okay. okay. I think that's good. Yeah, he's he's right. They're here. Yeah. They're in the room. It's all normal. Room. Okay. It's so. Do you think that politics is <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Maybe, but in, these agencies are in Australia. They, they, even if they're, it's a second-hand thing, you know, Australian intelligence talks to the US, and the US talks to the Israeli. That's it. It's all done. Okay. So um, I'd like to say, please, please give a big round of applause to our panel. <laughs> Summer has asked to perform one more poem for us, and I think that'd be really, really good. We we got a lot of healing to do, and we got a lot of energy to mobilize for the struggle. All right, so let's heal. Um, so I wrote this uh, a while back here in Sydney when we were doing the Maryville Council um, boycott, divestments and sanctions action. And there was um, a lady here, a Jewish lady, who was just petrified of the idea of equality. Like, she just kept saying, how? Um, and, uh, and this poem came back to my mind recently because of all the talk about uh, the two-state solution, the equality, how does it look like, uh, what does the day after look like? And I think it's important for us to imagine what it looks like. And I call this poem the Liberation Anthem. It is dedicated to the people of Israel who fear our freedom. Don't be afraid. We will liberate you too. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. That day, you and I will stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, watching a new dawn wipe away decades of hate and savagery. The day that I rise from the ashes of your oppression, I promise you I will not rise alone. You too will rise with me. You will be liberated from my, your tyranny and my freedom will bring you salvation. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. I'll craft new expressions outside of the suffocating language that has occupied me. Your words are like your walls. They encroach on my humanity. I am more than demography. I am neither your collaborator nor your enemy. I am not your moderate, not your terrorist, not your fundamentalist, Islamist, extremist, militant, radical. I am more than adjectives, letters, and syllables. I will construct my own language. I will defeat your words of power with the power of my words. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. I don't want to obliterate you. I refuse to hate you. Don't care to demonize or crystallize or theorize your intentions. Every breath you draw reminds me you are human. The sound of your beating heart is rhythm familiar to my ears. You and I are no different. We are made of blood and tears. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. I will resist and soar above your matrix of control. And with the strength of my will, your walls will fall. And this concrete that segregates us we can use it to rebuild homes. Your bulldozers and your tanks will dissolve into the earth. The sap will run in the olive trees. The gates will open wide for the refugees. We will be free. We will be free. And I will be your equal. And only then you will be mine my other self, my fellow human being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Stuart Reese.